going to start by reading uh, Laura Stanley's poem, um, who sadly couldn't be here today, but she was commended in the challenge and has asked me to read her poem on her behalf. So I'm going to begin with that. Let me first give you the proper introduction to the lovely Laura Stanley, who is a lesbian poet from the West Midlands. She is currently studying uh, MA in creative writing at the University of Birmingham. Uh, her poetry has been published widely in Bath Mag, Magma, Street Cake. Uh, she won the Staunch Short Story Prize in 2020. She also placed third in the Young Poets Network Pop Culture Poetry Challenge last year with an amazing entry. Um, that's actually a video. Uh, like a Star Wars style video, because it's about pop culture, um, but it's about it's about kind of grief. So it's it's really a fantastic marrying of the, the pop culture and, and like really important topics. Um, her work is also forthcoming in After Sylvia, which is an anthology in response to Sylvia Plath, published by Nine, Nine Archers Press later this year, which we've also had a little hand in here at Young Poets Network. Um, so this poem that was commended in the challenge, it evokes what it's like to be a protest, so that's the prompt that it's resp responding to, or rather it's, it's responding to how, what it was like to be at a series of protests throughout time, and this poem moves throughout centuries. As Laura writes, uh, as a note to the poem, the words in italics are taken from political demonstrations, so she's actually kind of, it's kind of a found poem in parts. Um, the first phrase in italics is from a banner carried by female reformers such as Mary Fields at the Peterloo Massacre in 1819, which uh, P.B. Shelley wrote famously about in his poem Mask of Anarchy. Um, so she's, she's treading in these all these footsteps here. Uh, the second phrase in italics is, is from a banner carried by suffragettes like Ada Wright, who were attacked by the police on Black Friday in 1910. And the third phrase in italics is from a placard carried by a woman at uh, Sarah Everard's vigil in 2021. Um, and before I begin, uh, just a little content warning that this poem deals with gender-based violence. Um, obviously, a lot of the poems we're going to hear today do have difficult themes, so feel free to step away from your computers at any moment uh, if you need to. Um, and having said all that, I shall share my screen and I shall begin the poem. Okay. Can you give me a, a little thumbs up if you can all see that? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, I am only trying to write poetry by Laura Stanley. You say to the yeoman in St. Peter's Field before you leap off the speaker's platform and your dress catches on a nail, before his saber slashes through cotton, through whalebone. I am only trying to write poetry, you say to the king's cavalry. Let us die like men and not be sold as slaves. But your cries are crushed by hundreds of hooves, dislocated amongst the scattered shoes and straw bonnets. I'm only trying to write poetry, you say, to the constable patrolling the alleys and sniffing out women for syphilis, but he scrapes you from the cobbles. I'm only trying to write poetry, you say, to the peeler who locks you in the sanatorium, strips all the words from you and cranks the metal speculum. I'm only trying to write poetry, you say to the bobbies as you march to Parliament Square, but they tear up your banners. Women's will beats, Asquiths won't. And they squeeze and twist your breasts, lift up your skirt and drag you to the side street. I'm only trying to write poetry, you say, to the crowds of onlookers who jeer and laugh and push you back into the center of a black eye. I am only trying to write poetry, you say, to the lawman outside the House of Commons before he strikes you with his truncheon. I am only, he flings you to the floor and strikes you again. I am only trying to write poetry, you say, to the officer who stops you on your CCTV lined walk home from a friend's house, but he holds up his warrant card and shoves you in his car. I am only trying to write poetry, you say, to the Met, with your hands wrenched behind your back and your head pressed to the band stand floor. Abuse of power comes as no surprise. And you hear, rather than see, boots stamping out candles, grinding flowers to pulp. I am only trying to write poetry, you say, to your husband as he gets ready for duty, as he neatens his tie and shines his badge to a sharp glint as you watch his knuckles flex. 
Thank you, Laura. Well done. Congratulations again in the challenge. Um, yes, so sorry that she couldn't be here, but I'm glad that we were able to hear her poem. Um, okay, that is quite enough for me. I'm going to introduce our first young poet performing today. Felix Stokes uh, is a neurodivergent and disabled classics student at Brasenose College, Oxford. He has read at the Poetry Cafe in Covent Garden on multiple occasions, uh, wonderfully, and has placed in a number of challenges on Young Poets Network. Uh, he writes, of course, his own poetry in English, but also likes to translate in and out of the many niche languages he speaks, including Latin and Esperanto. Uh, his poem, To Those Afraid of Letting Disabled Students Succeed, was long listed in this challenge, um, and it responds delicately and eloquently to Vanessa's letter writing prompt. Here is Felix Stokes. Hello, oh, yes. Uh... So my, yeah, my poem specifically as well, it's about ableism within the education system, which as a neurodivergent and disabled student, I have had to deal with my fair share of um, a lot of my friends as well, unfortunately. Um, and this specifically was prompted by uh, my most recent set of exams, which were not, were not pretty, but yeah, it could have been could have been set up in a way that would have been significantly easier for my yeah, disabilities. But alas, um, yes. There it is. To those afraid of letting disabled students succeed. You build me a stage out of lava and force my feet to dance. You grade me the lowest you're after, but do let me advance. Still, I fill out your form to inform you my bones have melted down and I'm dancing on raw bleeding ankles. And if I slip, I'll drown. So perhaps if you could, you'd consider my dance was not so great. I know that you've marked me a 5.3, but when I can walk, I'm an eight. You sit at your desk, air conditioned, and read my letter through. You shrug and robotically tell me there's nothing you can do. You tell me that I should be proud for dancing as I could when everyone else that I danced with, you let them dance on wood. Thank you so much, Felix. Um, ah, it's so good to hear you read. Um, and yeah, what a powerful poem. Those last two lines always get me. Thank you so much um, for writing and sharing. Um, okay, uh, next up we have Elliot Walaszek, um, who is a 21 year old poet belonging to London. Um, his poems play with the parts left out, moving in the textures of betweenness, uh, through a kaleidoscopic lens of transmasculinity, queerness, mutation, mythology, memory, and muteness. He is an alumnus of Roundhouse Poetry Collective and Apples and Snakes Writing Room. And if you're in London and you're a writer, you should definitely check those two programs out because they're wonderful. Um, he was the 2020 Roundhouse Slam winner and BBC World's first semi-finalist in 2021, which both of which are extremely impressive. Um, and his poem, Ingrown, is commended in this challenge and it's a beautiful, precise response to Vanessa's prompt about writing the body as protest. Um, so without further ado, here is Elliot. Hi. Um, yeah, so this first poem is yeah, about bodily protest um, and it's called Ingrown. One hair, 
not liking what he seeks, sneaks back into the skin, piercing like a pin, crawls back through gaps in the flanks, back to soft throbbing tissue within. He can't stand the open endedness. So what? So what? So what? I'm stuck, all curled up like a cigarette butt, defunct. So what? So what? I'm happening. I'm happening somewhere. I'm happening somewhere else. Thank you. Um, I want to read a, another poem, um, which for me has, at the moment, uh, is kind of reigniting as a, as a protest poem, um, because the situation for trans healthcare in the UK is looking more uncertain, and it was pretty uncertain before. Um, I wrote this poem in 2020 um, while I was on a very long waiting list. Um, it's called Waiting List for the Sun. They won't tell you this, but on the rope ladder to the sun, there will be very long waiting lists. They won't tell you this, but they'll keep getting longer and you'll keep waiting and you'll hang one-handed looking down at the rungs beneath you, each one a younger you, waiting. All your other hands pressing the phone call to your cheek, the cheek for them to tell you another nine months, another two years. Squint. Each rung above you like the surface of a sweet oasis. Each rung above you like a scar glittered with gasping suns. Each rung above you a mirage that slivers in the grip of waking. Each rung above you another summer suffocated. Around you, invisible bodies plummet. Their names burnt, each finger a syllable plied. For some, this is a tightrope, not just a waiting line. So, Naturally, you might find yourself narrowing your eyes at the sun in suspicion, only to find always the light dancing in between the stitches of your damp lashes. Keep climbing blind with fate, despite the weight, the weight. One day, these rope burns will be useful for chariot riding. Let me tell you, one day, all the world will be your rooftop party. Yes, you can have an orgy, the glory. Can you taste it? Yes, sweet. The gods keep them, your canyon chest, the post-op poems, keep them, keep dreaming, baby boy, keep dreaming. Yes, yes, your chest, treasure chest, finally your unbound chest. Worth it just to swim again.
you can make it through the waiting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elliot. That was so powerful and so mesmerizingly uh, read. Um, so thank you, really important. Um, okay, we shall move on to our next commended poet, Perla Kantagian, um, who is a Lebanese Armenian poet, editor and journalist uh, with writings appearing in over 30 publications. Um, Perla's work has been commended uh, and awarded, uh, apart from the by us at the Poetry Society, also by the Indigo Open Poetry Prize, the Binstead Poetry Prize, Wildfire Words New Voices Worth Pamphlet Award, and the EHP Barnard Poetry Prize. Her poem, Half Woman, Half Starlight, has been selected to be archived on the lunar surface with the Lunar Codex Project in 2022, um, which is amazing. Um, she's currently studying for her MA in Creative Writing Poetry at UEA, as the 2021-22 Sunny Meta Scholar and her poem, How Do You Say? I'm gonna say F you <laughs> currently. Be warned, there's some strong language ahead. Um, uh, how do you say F you in your language? Uses snatches of text conversation, ironically to, to resist being made to feel other and, and kind of fixed in identity. Um, so here to share her commended poem of protest, Perla. Hi everyone. Um... Well, I think, Helen, you wrapped everything up in a nice way. Uh, so basically, this poem is uh, the underworld of responses, surface responses to questions such as where are you from or where is Lebanon, where is Armenia, always the Kim Kardashian uh, connection. Um, so yeah, think of it as what happens beneath the responses to such uh, questions, which are otherwise deemed very natural, normal questions. Um, so yeah, I stuck at explaining my poems. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go ahead and read it. <laughs> uh, so yes, yeah, strong language in this one. How do you say fuck you in your language? Lol, which one? Delivered at 12.43 AM. Terminus, from Latin terminus. Plural termini, an end, a limit boundary line. You see, I don't know where to take all these. Is that like where they ride camels to work? Oh, where is that? Oh, I didn't know Kim was from there. Sorry, could you say that again? You're from where? Or where to be taken by them? Oof, what a heavy combination. Oh, that's like where that trending mushroom explosion happened, yeah? What a heavy combination. Hey, my friend might join the pub crawl, but he's like against what his government did to you guys. Is that okay? He's very chill. There is a covenant between us. Heavy, but we never mention it. At times, I wonder of my simulacrum in the response, where the I is in the, you know what? That's not discussed politics. I'm from there, but also from there, but now here doing this as an escape. In grammar, determiners. In Armenian, panda bahner, keepers of the gates. Panda vochka bahen, panda bahnera. The prison is kept alive by its keepers. In Arabic, we say had to signify end, hodud to signify endings, haddid to order a determinant. I'm not gonna end this poem because I know what it means to determine ends. I know what it means to be anything but still and silent and still not matter. Thank you. This is my second protest poem. Um, it's actually very, very freshly penned down, like say two days ago, two nights ago. Uh, it sort of deals with uh, how when a certain group of people are so uh, engorged with the with fight and struggle and resistance that they forget about 
the other side uh, and for at least when it comes to Armenians, uh, the denial of the genocide, which led to the displacement, which led to my being born in Lebanon, etc. Uh, how that sort of the trauma, the uh, ancestral weight carries on. And there's always that need to always be on the defensive. Um, so this poem is sort of a reminder that, a reminder of how important it is to balance the weight between resistance and also living. What will our words assassinate? The body as a tree is a cliche but our heads are pomegranates. Overwatered spines bring sour fruit. Underwatered spines bring fruit so dry in its throat of grief that it stuffs itself with metaphors to charge the heinous hands, administer the legacy of surviving. But what then are we stomaching to dampen the hunger that comes after the hunting? When their cold comes again, We've readied our fists tight with wrath, but what will we feed our children in their hiding? Oh, I'm tired of analogizing. Oh, I'm tired of analogizing. I'll water myself out and grow gardens out of the cleaves in my wampum, hold my rifle with the other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Perla. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, and wow. I mean, you said you were bad at introducing your poems, but I think you did such a really brilliant job. So much to think about. Um, yes, so exciting to have all these amazing poets. I just, I just feel so lucky. Um, okay, so we're going to take a short intermission and listen to uh, Luke Wright's poem um, now about the uprising of 1381. So we're traveling way back in time um, and uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to hear a little bit about um, the events of that, of that uprising. Um, the first uprising, mass uprising in England, I think it is known as. Um, I shall introduce Luke briefly now. So he calls himself a spit and sawdust wordsmith. Um, his poems are inventive and engaging, documenting 21st century British life and previous centuries too with wit humanity and panache um he performs his work with snarl and spit and has toured his wares around the world for 20 years um he is an amazing performer um and i'm excited to share this poem with you now which we commissioned as part of this project um so i hope that this works always a risk with sharing a video uh but somebody <laughs> unmute and shout at me if it doesn't work here we go This is the Peasants' Revolt, uh, and it starts with a quote from John Ball, when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman. What's that there? A poet's here to spin another rhyme and cast a wordy spell to whip us dewy-eyed through time. Perhaps you'll draw some parallels and make us scratch our chins and land a blow or two, much to the status quo's chagrin. And hark, we'll hear the mighty falling, oh, what a happy din. Or maybe he's just here to say, the house will always win. To Essex then, to rebel Essex, bolshy stubborn Essex. Forget its modern loads of money, H.D. Brow aesthetics. Back then it was a rural place, and rural England reeled. The Black Death took near half of them, they feel it in the field. And there's a war, a bloody war, a war that never rends, a distant war, a costly war. It takes their wage and friends. A war for rich men's glory, which historians will note, and so their kids will have to learn its awful facts by rote. But look, I'll put away my soapbox. It's anachronistic. John Ball preaches from the hedgerow, something socialistic in his verse. From town to town he goes and sows a seed, which sprouts as bailiffs come from London representing greed. Until in 1381, at Brentwood, they say no. They face the king's man, fob him off with sticks and ancient bows. And then the rabble organises. Some ride north to raise more workers from East Anglia. Some ride south to liaise with Kentish men who've raised a mob to free a man who ran away from serfdom but got caught. And so it all began. And some of them were just and brave, committed to their cause. 
and some were simply angry, and some no doubt were bores. But revolutions need all three, and then they need a star, a charismatic leader who can strut the strut and blah the blah, so enter then what Tyler. As nom de gruer they shout out to this day on protests who we don't know much about. A canvas onto which to paint our hope and our belief. And what a thing it must have been to see them at Blackheath. Thousands of them, starving, stinking, further now from home than most of them have ever, ever, ever been. And what a dice they've thrown. Their anger set to desperation, each a wanted man, as Tyler brings up Ball to speak, when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? He says this, stops each pike from rattling. All men in nature were created alike. And all their lives they'd toiled and starved, felt boots upon their backs, had seen their children waste away for what? A rich man's tax. But John Ball's words were like a spell of just divinity. Cast off the yoke of bondage and recover liberty. Now, hear the stomp stomp of their sticks. Each bloody blistered heel. Their bellows fill the heath, the sound of folk who will not kneel. They march from there to London on their hope and hobble feet and pour their rage like kerosene on men of the elite. They empty jails, burn offices, melt metals, crush up gems, attack the homes of immigrants, throw records in the Thames and they write a list of councillors. The spads around the king, these learned men, these tricksy men, they blame for everything. They meet the king at Marland, this boy of just 14 who leaves his ministers and faces England's vented spleen alone. He compromises with them. His counsellors will live. But in return, he signs a charter promising to give the serfs their freedom. Was that it? Like that, the thing was done. Most rebels turn and head for home, believing they had won. But Tyler tells his men to stay. The bargain's not enough. Perhaps old Watt is drunk in power. Perhaps he spies the bluff. But either way, his rebels stay, and they rampage through the dark. A splintered night, a cutthroat night, a night of howls and barks. When all the rage of a barbaric age froths up from the throats of men bereft of hope and trust. Come morning, London smokes and sobs and bleeds while Tyler calls his battered men from brawls to meet the king at Smithfield, beyond the city walls. A thousand rebels to the west, the king's men to the east. The king calls Tyler forward. He ambles, grins and greets King Richard as his brother. The audacity of that reverberates around the men. They feel it like a slap. The courtiers all bristle. What demands another charter? And while you're at it, bring some ale. A stand like that and barter with the king. Oh, he's gone too far. The courtiers step up. There's words, there's slurs, there's jostle. Perhaps they spill his cup, but either way, what Tyler turns, and that's all the King's Guard needs. The mayor of London pulls his sword, he thrusts, Tyler bleeds, falls to his knees. The peasants scream, rattle pikes, rage bows. But Richard, 14 years of age, rides forward, calm, composed. I am your captain, follow me. It works, but how? Search me. He leads the mob to Clerkenwell and he offers clemency. And leaderless they take the deal and hobble home again. Perhaps they feel victorious as misty summer rain falls down and cools their sunburnt scalps. For serfdom is no more. They see their homes and kids again, their soggy spirits soar. But back in ransacked London town, the boy king slyly grins and gathers troops. We'll teach these serfs. The house will always win. He rides north with his axemen, revokes the clemency. You wretches are detestable, you who seek equality with lords are unworthy to live. Rustics you are still. You will remain in bondage. He then revokes the bill. The outlawed English serfdom goes back on all his deals. He executes the ringleaders, pours blood on English fields. Protest terrifies the tyrant. He doubles on his grip. Because in truth, he knows the house 
is down another brick. Thank you to Luke for writing that amazing poem that um, at once kind of, uh, I guess, mythologizes, plays its part in mythologizing this, this crazy event of 1381, um, but also I think complicates it um, with the not so noble uh, acts of the rebels in rampaging around London and uh, attacking immigrants. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's a poem that does a lot of, a lot of interesting things, um, but yeah, very, I think, vividly brings to life what happened uh, 700 years ago, which is amazing. Um, okay, so, so we return to our, our roster of young poets now. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce next uh, Ke Xin Huang, um, an award-winning trilingual poet and 23-year-old student studying at the University College London, um, but who is based in China. So we're jumping across the globe now, um, which is the wonderful thing about doing these online events. Um, she has won a second prize in the third International Festival of Poetry and Liquor, Poetic Flavor Composition Competition, and won a cash prize of 10,000 won, which is equivalent to about a thousand pounds. You don't get, you, people say you don't get paid in poetry. Well, Kushin has. <laughs> <laughs> um, she is highly commended in the 2022 Abachi Prize for Poetry and her poems can be found variously in journals like Part Particle Literary Magazine, The Writer's Block, uh, Wingless Dreamer Anthology, Poetry Monthly and others. Um, Vanessa Kasule, who uh, set this challenge and judged it, chose uh, her poem as a third prize winner, commenting on it that the poem is highly experimental and inv invigorating in a form that she's she'd never encountered before, using short, sharp images and academic citation to intriguing effect, the poet has created a fizzy hybrid between the formal and the avant-garde. Who amongst us isn't haunted by a line as eerie as, eat crisps in the soul cage? So, away to the soul cage, please take it, uh, to take the mic, cushion. Okay, so the first poem is about London and Liverpool experiences me or my friends have lived through and about how academic writing can be related to poetry. Question, how to live through apocalypse? Hide in your dark bed, tips 2020, eat crisps in the soil cage, tips 2020, Make poems into canned food, turfs 2020, and bend your heart into Zoom squares, turfs 2020, and shed heel tears into rivers, turfs 2021, 2022, stack ambulance bricks into walls, turfs 2021, 2022, have a car crash using invisible wheelchair, turfs. 2021, 2022, and break, even it kills, line break, 2022. The second poem mentions murder. Protest of international students in Chicago. Learn to die. Who's next? Stop gun violence. We're here to learn, not to die. Breathing in an empty mouth of danger. Now each slogan in a foreign city forms our keys, forced to be shown. Marching here in the window getting snatched, facing the scent of blood, still learning through all the impossibilities. My flowery bear graduates from the wind. He graduates from death. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so brilliant. And yeah, um, it is, I think it is an amazing poem, the, the, the winning poem. Um, and it's also uh, exciting to see all these um, 
clearly there's other formal in innovations in your practice uh, with erasure and yeah, it's great. It's great to to hear it read aloud and to to be introduced to so much new work. Um, next up, we have um, we come back to the UK and to Sheffield um, with Charlie Jolly, who isn't able to be here today, but she sent um, a video um, of her reading her poem. Um, so she is a member of Sheffield Young Writers and has been published in Hive's anthology, Dear 2021. Uh, if you're in Sheffield, anyone in the audience, um, do check out um, Hive uh, because they, they are wonderful people. Um, she's also been published in Land of Poets, uh, which is a Seren book. Um, she is also, as I she's also a screenwriter. Um, and her comedy short Circle of Trust premiered at the Showroom Cinema in 2020 and her short play Life on Zoom was performed at the Montgomery Theatre in 2021. Um, her poem uh, won second prize and Vanessa Casule said of it, uh, this wryly humorous poem gently pokes fun at the foibles of protest. I chuckled knowingly at the image of the Girl Scout looped vine and the earnest singing of Give Peace a Chance. Uh, while this piece is gently satirical, it never descends into cruel caricature. The poet implicates themselves, questioning their own actions and motives. The final image of a dog escaping like a rolling yellow flame is stunning yet unsettling. The scene of political ardor is disrupted by this underlying threat of restlessness. And with that, I shall launch you into Charlie's wonderful video. Uh, and she's also going to introduce the poem. Hi, I'm Charlie Jolly. So my poem, We Tied Ourselves to the Nether Edge Tree, was inspired by the tree at the end of my road, which is known for being the last of its kind. So the council wanted to cut it down. So you'd have people from all down the street going over there, reading poems to it, singing to it, knitting for it. And as I was walking to school, I'd just find myself amongst all these really eclectic characters. And I'd just think to myself, you know, this is great writing material. So when I saw the challenge on Young Poets Network, I just thought it was the perfect opportunity to actually commit pen to paper and start writing this poem. So I wanted to project a gently comical, satirical undertone without seeming judgmental in any way. I wanted to showcase a more light-hearted view of protest in contrast to all these really hard-hitting, serious issues that we're faced with nowadays. And I felt like that met my style perfectly as well because I always drift into writing comedy because I love writing comedy scripts and comedy poems. So I could really embrace that in this challenge. So um, I hope you enjoy my poem. This is We Tied Ourselves to the Nether Edge Tree. Yesterday, early morning, so they could no longer ignore our green painted skin and gel penned objection. They could no longer silence our potent doorgo buys, moon pig pamphlets and nature poems. The tree was tinseled with plaited rope, lank like vine. Girl Scout looped in clove knots between our legs and elbows, grating our wrists like rusted handcuffs. Peter and his I'm so quirky wife Anne started busking. Kickbox karaoke as the CD player flickered to imagine. They strummed acoustic in a desperate Lennon Ono duo. I wish someone would have told them to stop. They really killed the atmosphere. Jana brought her Labrador along and tied its lead to the foot of the great oak. After three verses of Give Peace a Chance, it wriggled from the clenched fist of the worn string and sprung like a rolling yellow flame out of the park. Sometimes I felt others wanted to do the same. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you, Charlie, uh, wherever you are currently <laughs> in, in the world, probably in Sheffield somewhere. Um, yeah, it was great for me to hear that introduction um, that she gave because then I suddenly realised, oh, wait, I actually know what this poem is about because I have friends in Sheffield uh, who have told me of the, the tree protests, <laughs> like they're quite a big deal um, if, you're, if you're in that part of the country. So, um, yeah, really amazing to hear that um, from that. It's the tree down her road. Love that. Um, famous tree. <laughs> okay, we are coming to the end of the event and we just have one final poet um, to, to read to you today. Um, and that is the wonderful Maggie Wang. Uh, her recent work appears in Harvard Review, Poetry Wells and Bath Mag. 
She is a very prolific Ledbury Emerging Poetry Critic, Barbican Young Poet, uh, and also the Reviews Editor at Suspect, uh, which is the journal of a New York City based London, non London <laughs> literary nonprofit, Singapore Unbound. Uh, her debut pamphlet, The Sun on the Tip of a Snail's Shell, is forthcoming from the wonderful Hazel Press. She's very much a regular on Young Poets Network, um, and we're really delighted to have her here today. Vanessa uh, said of her first prize entry, um, this beautiful understated poem unfolds fluidly with gorgeous lines like where summer floods the banks of its own body juxtaposing with the quiet ominousness of you find the newspaper drowning on the stoop the idyllic natural environment of the poem curdles with images of unrest and violence hinting at how even the most serene of lives is inevitably disrupted by the re reality of our deeply troubled world um, it brings a whole lot of uh, topics into its reach um, and here is Maggie Wong to close the event. Over to you. Um, yes, so hi, I'm Maggie and um, yes, I like, I, I do try to be a regular on YPN because it's uh, one of the, my, I suppose, regular writing inspirations. Uh, so I really, it's, it's great to be here and I really appreciate the opportunity to read um, with some of the other brilliant young folks. So I'll start with, so Helen mentioned I have a forthcoming pamphlet which will be out in a little over a month. Uh, so I'm going to read a poem from that, which is also a post-protest poem uh, of sorts. So this is called Litany for a Resurrection, and it's about um, reintroduction of extinct and uh, species, extinct species or endangered species. Um, this particular one was inspired by a species of macaw, called Spixis macaw, which has recently been re reintroduced to its homeland in South America. Uh, but more broadly, I am interested in exploring questions of and, you know, how much can humans interfere in the environment um, before, you know, how, how much should we interfere in our environment? And, you know, if we mess something up and the only solution is uh, further messing things up, to what extent is that right? Um, so this is Litany for a Resurrection. A streak of blue against the stomach of the earth, outbreathed to break the crispness of the morning. Where farmland ends and forest begins, here the fog is heaviest. A branch breaks, spirals groundward, nestles into the arms of a younger tree, grafts itself. You have released them into the wild without language. Don't expect them to have memorized your maps. Hear them cry out, but don't call back. The air may yet fill with cannon fire. Let them spin in circles, purposeless. Forget sleep is impossible in springtime. Let them be as they would have been without you. Set them free in this small patch of memory. Pretend you can see eye to eye with them. Read the stars according to their mythology. Build a nest, tuck an egg into its fold, glean damselflies from the underside of the leaf. Mid-July and their bodies writhe against the drought. Let them die nameless, no tags against their throats to stifle song. Let them be as gravestones, memorials to what you are not. Let the scavengers pick them apart, feather by weightless feather. Their blood will dry into constellations. In a decade, the forest floor will still bear streaks of blue. You have never had such patience before. Um, and now to close off with, I'll read um, the poem, uh, my winning poem from this challenge. And um, it's called Poem, This Is Not Somewhere Else But Here. And uh, in the title and in the poem, I've taken inspiration from Muriel Rekaiser and Adrian Rich. So there's a, uh, so Muriel Rekaiser's poem um, has, has a poem titled Poem I Lived in the, in the First Century of World Wars. Um, so I've sort of um, taken the, the form of the title in the first line and also tried to sort of um, recall her very understated yet intimate tone 
And then um, Adrian Rich's poem is what kind of times are these and a the line, this is not somewhere else, but here is taken from that. Uh, so this is, I think, most explicitly a poem about climate change, but but more broadly about um, our own life and mortality, individual and collective. So this is a poem, this is not somewhere else, but here. This is not somewhere else, but here on earth, where summer floods the banks of its own body, and where, when you open the front door in the morning, you find the newspaper drowning on the stoop. Because this gives you pause, you also find the air sweetened with undetected metals. And above, instead of the sunrise shedding its blood across the stomachs of the matinal clouds, only a wisp of haze ascending from a nameless mouth. But no matter, let the paper beat itself into oblivion, and the rain wash its ink into the back garden. The tomato plants sip it through the straws of their xylem and find it bitter. You do not hear what complaints they leave, but only the knocking of their burgeoning fruit against the hollow chests of their staking. Above that, the chatter of the headlines sticks around, their music less like the evening market news than the sound of a requiem from another room. And you, who have nothing better to do, sit down to listen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maggie. And thank you so much to all of our readers today. Um, yes, please everyone join me in giving a final, you know, Zoom round of applause to Felix Stokes, Elliot Walashek, Perla Kentagian, uh, Kei Chun Huang, uh, Maggie Wang, and uh, two uh, poets in, in absentia, Charlie Jolly and um, Laura Stanley. Um, it's been such a joy to listen to you. We've covered from everything, I think, pretty much everything that you could protest about, <laughs> from like climate change to uh, misogyny, um, trans healthcare, disability rights, gun control, um, like racism and xenophobia, and like actually the experience of actually being at a protest. Um, so it's just been an amazing tour de force, I think, of protest poetry. And I'm so um, delighted and uh, just uh, inspired and amazed by all of your work. So thank you so much for sharing and for writing and submitting to the YPN Challenge. And I hope that we will read more of your work soon. Um, thank you, of course, to everyone who's behind the project, uh, people of 1381, including the Arts and Humanities Research Council, who uh, funded this entire project. Um, we're going to be releasing that video of Luke Wright uh, performing his poem, as well as a collaborative poem written by lots of primary school children about the, the uprising um, later in, in the autumn. So do look out for that. Um, and uh, I shall leave you with some, some news of, of what's coming up. Um, so if you're 11 to 17, the Four Young Poets of the Year Award deadline is tomorrow at midnight. Um, and if you're so if you're in the right age, please enter. It could change your life. It's foryoungpoets.org. It's free. You can submit as many poems as you want on any theme. I was a four young poet. Now look at me. I'm doing this job. Wouldn't be here without entering that competition as a 15 year old. So genuinely, please do go and enter or tell people who, who are that age to go and enter. Um, you never know what might come out of it. Um, four, to, four to 18 year olds can also enter the About Us poetry competition, but that closes on the 31st of August and the theme is connectivity and the universe. You can interpret that very broadly. Um, and we're also running two free online workshops next week uh, with Kat Francois and a uh, lovely poet who wrote that <laughs> that book of, uh, Rachel Plummer wrote a really lovely book of um, reimagining Scottish myths and folktales uh, through an LGBTQ plus lens. Um, 
called Wayne. Uh, so Rachel Plummer and Kat Francois running free workshops next week. Uh, so please do join them if you want to. I mean, like a free writing workshop, why wouldn't you? Um, you can look on the Poetry Society's website on our What's On page to book onto those. And we're also running Young Poets Network Challenges on Glass for the International Year of Glass and Finding Peace. Um, and that one has some exciting uh, potential performance opportunities and an anthology associated with it. So do go and have a look at those. And finally, starting next week, we'll be running weekly writing challenges throughout August, and they will be written by young poets and judged by those young poets as well. Um, so that will be something to keep you inspired and writing over the summer. Um, get on our mailing list if you're not already on it, as we'll be obviously updating you weekly with those. Um, I think that's that's all for me, um, but thank you so much uh, to all of our readers and to everyone who's here in the audience. Um, and I shall send you off now into your Saturdays feeling, I hope, uplifted, engaged and inspired. Um, and I hope to see you all again soon and to read more of your writing. Have a great weekend. Bye.